I'm very nervous, and when I am very nervous, I talk very fast. So we're going to go really fast through this thing. I'm here to talk about locality-sensitive hashing, a really fun algorithm I learned about when as working at SoundCloud, where I serve some amazing teams of data scientists as their humble manager. Clear. OK, so before I talk about locality-sensitive hashing, I need to review a few concepts so that we're all on the same page. To, this, to wit, we will define vectors. Then we will talk about machine learning algorithms and how they produce vectors. And after that, we will show how in recommendations algorithms where I work, we use these vectors and compare them to each other to produce recommendations. And we're going to talk about how slow that is. And then we're going to talk about how locality-sensitive hashing helps make this faster. <laughs> OK, vectors. Without going into the axioms of a vector space, a vector is a point in n-dimensional space relative to an origin. For example, here is a vector in one-dimensional space. It's a point on a line relative to this zero. Here is a vector in two-dimensional space. It's a point on a sheet of paper. Here is a vector in three-dimensional space. It's flexing my abilities to do drawings in Google Slides. <laughs> it is a point in a cube. And here is a vector in fourth-dimensional space, where the fourth dimension <laughs> is time. It's the fourth dimension is time. OK, here is, <laughs> if you want to have n dimensions, you can do this by just having n components that uniquely describe a point relative to an origin. Now you all know what a vector is. Now we can talk about machine learning. Uh, <laughs> Many machine learning algorithms take sequences of things and produce vectors for those things. Here is the real live SoundCloud recommendation algorithm taking sequences <laughs> of user histories and producing for each track a vector. Now, these algorithms do this in such a way that track vectors that are close to each other in this space happen to also be similar. And we use this to build recommendations. For example, here is a two-dimensional track vector space with some of my favorite albums. If we want to build recommendations for Joni Mitchell, we will just compare it in either length or cosine angle to all the other tracks in the catalog and pick the five top ones. If you want to then produce it for Bruce Coburn's self-titled album from 1970, you have to compare it to all the other tracks in the catalog and pick the five best ones. And this takes a really long time. It's known in computer science as the K nearest neighbors problem because you have to compare for each track to the rest of the catalog and produce the top five tracks, or as I like to call, K lit tracks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, it turns out that doing all these comparisons is really complex. If you have n tracks in your catalog, it'll take n steps of your algorithm because you have to compare it to itself. And if your, um, <laughs> if your catalog of tracks is 130 million like they are at SoundCloud, then this takes just too damn long, OK? So thankfully, some people came up with this really great algorithm called locality-sensitive hashing that's going to solve all these problems for us. Break. I'm going to ref tell you what we talked about so far. We talked about vectors as points in the space relative to an origin. We then talked about machine learning algorithms that take sequences of things and produce tracks for those things. We then talked about how to use those tracks, which are close and therefore similar, to produce recommendations by comparing them to each other, and this takes too damn long. Now, locality-sensitive hashing is hopefully going to make this a lot easier for us. Before, oh, and let me define what that is. Locality-sensitive hashing is an algorithm that takes vectors as input and produces binary as output. And it does it in such a way that small changes to the input manifest themselves as small changes in the binary output. And in this sense, it preserves locality. And I promise you, you'll have an intuition for this by the end of this talk. <sighs> Before I talk about the algorithm, let me give you an analogy. How many of you live in Queens? Woo! Yeah, OK. How many of you live in Queens? Ask your friend who lived in Brooklyn over for dinner, and that friend said, Queens is too damn far. <laughs> OK, yeah? I stayed in Queens once. It was awesome. I'm from Berlin, by the way, and originally from Canada. Now, the reason that your friend said <laughs> the reason your friend said it was so far away is because we draw these arbitrarily boundaries everywhere. And what we say is that we draw this line. It's called the neighborhood. And anyone on the other side of that line is just too damn far. And this is at the heart of locality-sensitive hashing. You draw arbitrarily lines, and people on the other side are just too damn far. So let's talk about this algorithm. On the left, we have vectors. And then on the right, we have binary. I told you this algorithm takes vectors and produces binary. So we're going to do this. This vector space is two-dimensional. One axis is happiness. The other axis is how dead you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> the algorithm goes as follows. Pick a random plane that passes through the origin. Then pick an, an orientation and assign vectors on one side of the plane of 1 and vectors on the other side of the plane at 0. And don't stop. Pick a random line that passes through the origin. Pick an orientation. Assign the vectors on one side of the plane a 1 and vectors on the other side of the plane a 0. Don't stop. Pick a random plane. Pick an orientation. Assign vectors on one side of the plane a 1, and vectors on the other side of the plane a 0. And don't stop. Pick a random plane. 
taken orientation, assigned vectors on one side a 1, and vectors on the other side a 0. As you can see, we have vectors on the left-hand side and binary on the right-hand side. That is locality-sensitive hashing. <sighs> OK, so I need to show you two things. One, I need to show you that this algorithm preserves locality, and then I need to show you how it can help us find recommendations. And I'm going to do that. Let's look at this. <laughs> Let's look at this binary representation very quickly. I'm going to make a claim. I'm going to claim that the probability that you picked a random line that separated two emoji is proportional only to the angle between them. So think about this for a second. You have two vectors. They're really close together. We're picking random lines. What is the likelihood if these two vectors are close together that your line separates them? It's pretty small. Now, if the vectors are, if the vectors are far apart, the likelihood of you picking a random line that separates them is very large. And in this way, they are proportional. Now I'm going to give you all a quiz. And I'm not going to ask you for the answer because we don't have enough time. But how many lines separated these two emoji looking only at the bit strings? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> the answer is one. And it is exactly the bits that are different between these two bit strings. So I now make the claim that if you count the number of bits, that are different between two of these binary representations, that this is proportional to the angle between the emoji. And of course, this is the case, because the only time you separate a plane is <laughs> the only time you separate two emojis is when you pick a plane that separates them. And the likelihood of you doing this is proportional to the angle between them. Another complex way of saying this is that the Hamming distance, which is the number of bits that are different divided by their length, is proportional to the angle between the vectors. So that's what we mean when we say they preserve locality. Somehow, this binary representation preserves the fact that they were one side or the other on the line, and this is related to the angle. But I haven't told you how to use this to find k nearest neighbors, and we're going to do that right now. We're going to take you back in your mind to the bucket analogy. <laughs> Suppose I wanted to order these uh, emoji in such a way that emojis in the same bucket appear next to each other. Suppose this bucket. All I need to do is take this representation and lexically sort it, which means sort from the left and the right where your alphabet is just 1 and 0. But I need to make sure that my red and blue bits are first, and they are in this representation. I give it a sort, and emojis that are in the same bucket appear next to each other. We have some false positives like the ghost, but we'll filter that out later. And we can keep doing this. We can do this for another bucket. Here is the bucket spanned by the blue and green line. And because we chose these lines randomly in any order, we can permute them in any order. And so we just go and permute them, lexically sort them, and we see here that emoji in the same bucket are nearest each other. And we can keep doing this random permutation of bits and lexical sorting to find candidates. And this is our this becomes our locality-sensitive hashing algorithm. So let me summarize what the algorithm is in entirety. You have a vector space full of things. You pick a random plane that separates this vector in half. Or, sorry, you pick a random plane that separates the space in half. Then you choose an orientation. And you assign two vectors on one side of that plane a 1, and vectors on the other side of that plane a 0. Then you repeat this d times. And if you repeat this d time for each vector, you'll have a binary representation that is d bits long. If you then take this representation and randomly permute the bits and lexically sort them, you will find candidates for your recommendations. And then you can just use cosine similarity to filter out the bad ones. That's it. Why is this better? Well, first of all, I told you our original algorithm was n squared, but sorting is n log n. And our algorithm, depending on the number of times we permute bits and lexically sort them, is just s times n times log n, which is much faster than n squared when you have um, 130 million tracks. Uh, also, we can use um, the fact that the Hamming distance was proportional to the angle to reduce all angle calculations to just bit math, which CPUs are very good at. And this is the only time in my career as a software engineer, which is very short, where a constant factor actually mattered in an algorithm. OK. <laughs> that is the end of locality-sensitive hashing, an algorithm that takes vectors as input and produces binary as output in such a way that it preserves locality. And it does this by splitting places in half and assigning each vector as ones and zeros on either sides of these planes. You might ask, is there more? This algorithm only preserved the angle. And you might say, I want to preserve the length of these vectors because, hey, maybe that's important. And there is such an algorithm that does this. You might say, hey, all my vectors have a rank associated with them because we put page rank somewhere in there. And you can do this. It is called rank-based hashing. In fact, you might even say, hey, why did we pick these planes so randomly? This seems absurd. Why didn't I look at the data? Well, you can do this, and it's called supervised hashing. You can pick the best planes you want. 
And because it's 2017, somebody has figured out how to do deep hashing using, <laughs> using deep learning. This is my favorite web page on the internet, by the way. And there are many papers about deep hashing. I have no idea how that works, but that's it. That is locality-sensitive hashing. May all your vectors be hashed. <laughs> <laughs>